everyone in the Asian community, you know, there was always two parents, but we were the only ones where we just had our mum. And you know, in the nicest possible way if that can come across is that, you know, my mum equally was seen as charity in a nice way. You know, people wanted to help her. People saw her and said, oh, bless her. You know, she's got, she's raising two, two boys by herself. And this gave both Sonny and I this fire this aggressive desire to be more, you know, to find more, you know, and even to this date now, we are aggressively driven. One of the most important things is trust. You know, no matter how long you and I have been friends for, regardless of what the situation may be, if I break your trust once, even if we've been friends for 20 years, if I break your trust once sure we'll carry on being friends but there'll always be something at the back of your mind when something happens can i trust him on today's episode kalpesh patel co-founder of asian wealth magazine and founders club kalpesh thank you so much for joining me today thank you for having me let's start with a super easy one what's your purpose <laughs> it's not really an easy one i know um, i know and i think i i think it's not really an easy one because it, it it always changes. When I say always, I mean, you know, it changes through life, right? My purpose now is is peace. Hmm. And, it, and it sounds weird saying it like that. But when I was younger, my, my grandfather always used to say the richest man in the world is the man who has peace. The man who can sleep well at night, you know. So for me, that's now the purpose. Hmm. Purpose, and I say peace in, in a way where I have two daughters, so making sure that they are at ease, they make themselves happy, that will bring me peace, you know. My wife, making sure she has everything she needs. As And when I say everything she has in terms of her being her, is her cup full, you know, these things will bring me peace. So actually my purpose now is peace. Very nice. This is the first time I hear this answer, yeah. <laughs> but it makes a lot of sense. And what I heard from what you just said, it's a lot of making sure that the people most important to you are good and you are good with them. So I guess relationships are uh, really important to you. Hugely, I can from <laughs> hugely, you know, and I've, I've realized probably over the last year or so, that's probably my one superpower, mm. you know, um, there's many things that I'm not good at. There's a few things I am and relationships is one. Cultivating them, maintaining them? Both, mm. both. I think they're, they're equally as important as, as one another. And also understanding that they are very fragile things, right? Relationships are very, very fragile. And I, I think we all know you could spend years cultivating a relationship and like that, wrong moves can obviously break relationships. Do you, know? you reckon though? I feel like if they're very strong relationships and they're founded on on both of you being on the same page and sharing the same values, it's hard to to have those scenarios where they just break. Yeah, I think there's certain things you can't get away from. I mean, one of the most important things is trust. You know, no matter how long you and I have been friends for, regardless of what the situation may be, if I break your trust once, even if we've been friends for 20 years, if I break your trust once, if I break that trust once, sure, we'll carry on being friends, but there'll always be something at the back of your mind when something happens, can I trust him, you know? This is so, so true. And I ponder upon this often. Is there really nothing we can do? Time, time is the only thing that we can do. You know, there is nothing, if there was a situation where I had broken that trust, there is nothing that I can say or do that is going to fix it. You know, that is something that has to be mended within you because it's something I broke. Now, only time can do that. So there's nothing that if I was the one to break the trust, there's nothing that I can do proactively. It's just a matter of passing of the time and not repeating the same mistake, I suppose. Of course. But again, you know, by you not repeating that same mistake also takes time. Right. So, you know, if you equally, if you are doing things to, to mend that consciously or subconsciously, I will also know that Dan is doing that because, yeah. you know, she wants to mend this. Right. So it, the only thing that happens is time and time fixes a lot of things. We've gone in real deep, right? From yeah, the start, haven't that's we? how I so, like to roll. Yeah. <laughs> Straight into the deep end. <laughs> so just to finish off that, how do you cultivate your peace? Aside being making sure that your relationships are well taken care I, of. I think I think it's really analyzing who you are and the world around you and constantly growing. And I think, look, 
where I was pre-COVID and the businesses that I was involved with pre-COVID to where I am now, there's been a huge change, not just for me, but I think obviously a lot of people. But from a from a business point where we are now, you know, we are immersed in the world of, of growth and evolution. And it has to start with us. It has to start where we are. So now what I do, the conversations I have, the people I surround myself with, um, the actions I take are all around growth and evolution, you know, which ultimately, I hopefully, you know, will lead to peace. So far, so good. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so far, so good. Don't get me wrong. I have my days. Of course, as we all we, do. As we all do. Um, but so far, so good. If I asked you whether there was a moment in your early days when you adapted a belief or a conviction that to this day has made a very strong impact on you? That's also a very interesting one because somebody asked me a very similar question recently. I said, what is your superpower? What are you absolutely great at? And even then, and I, you know, I had to really think, you know, if I had to really think about, okay, what, I, what is the one thing that really from a very young... It might have been just an event or something. Somebody said something or something happened to you, observed something mm. that really something clicked within you and you were like, oh, it can be a good or bad thing. Yeah. But it changed you. I'll t- I tell you what it is. And I, I think it was my desire to succeed. What triggered that? You know, so when I was growing up, my brother and I, so there's, you know, that we're, uh, there's just my, my brother, Sonny and I, and we grew up with very, very little. And I know it's, it's very cliche, you know, the rags to riches uh, story, but we were raised by our mother. So my father and mother, they divorced when we were very young. I was about eight, my brother was about four. And in Asian culture, it's very, very taboo, especially in the 80s, it, 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 you know, it didn't really happen. So we were now confronted by this situation where everyone around us, all our family, all of our friends, you know, everyone in the Asian community, you know, there was always two parents, but we were the only ones where we just had our mum. And in, a, in the nicest possible way, if that can come across, is that, you know, my mum equally was seen as a as charity, you know, but in a, in, a, in a nice way, you know, people wanted to help her. People saw her and said, you know, Oh, bless her. You know, she's got, she's raising two, two boys by herself, you know, so they took pity and they did help her. But equally, what we were seeing is, you know, why, why? You Disempowerment? Know, why? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and this gave both Sonny and I this fire, this aggressive desire mm. to, to be more, to, you know, to find more, you know, and even to this date now, we are aggressively driven you know, in what we do. And and there's never enough. Like, we'll always kind of, okay, well, we've got here. How do we do more? How do we be more? How do we look for more? How do we grow, you know? And um, all that goes back to that stage I, in your life. I believe so. That would I, make a lot of sense. I believe so, because even, even now, you know, we still have that hunger, but it stems from when we were young and we didn't have much and what we saw equally in society. This just makes me think, once again how things that we think are adversities and are our kryptonite and are the bad things in our lives actually so often so often are triggers to something great yeah absolutely and it's you know Donna, i i honestly believe there is a systematic problem now um with the new generation and i say that even from from my own you know because you know as i mentioned i've got two daughters my brother's got triplets three so between us we have five girls and Sonny and I constantly have a conversation about do the girls have the right fire? Are we instilling the right fire in them? You know, and you sometimes you can't. What do is this. the right fire? Well, I guess you is know, there such a thing as the right fire? Wow, um, I believe there is a right fire, uh, but sometimes you can't be taught the right fire. Sometimes what it, is the right fire? Well, I guess the right fire is that fire that burns at its core. Mm-hmm. So this is something that will burn forever. You know, from the point it starts to even when you like, so even now, the right fire. For Are you some, talking about that hunger, that ambition? Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, call it hunger, call it ambition. Um, that spark, you know, it has to it has to be so strong. Are you afraid that they might not have it because they're in a different situation that you and I've your brother? Be, I've been scared from day one, Dana. I've been scared from day one. And it's not just us. Look, you know, the kids, 
and not just my kids or Sonny's kids, and I think kids generally, look, you know, if there is this frame framework where migrants' parents, you know, will go from one country to another, okay? Usually they end up with very little to start off with. They, they start off with very little. Their children, call them generation one, mm -hmm. their children who are generation two, the ones that are born and raised are blessed to be born and raised in a better place in a safe country absolutely opportunities. so sunny and i were generation two my mother was from india my my father was born and raised in uganda um you know they came to this country sunny and i were both born here born and bred south london boys but we saw the hardship we saw the hardship that my mum went through we grew up in a two-bedroom council house. You know, we went through that system. So we saw it. That spark came alive. Now, my daughters, Sunny's daughters, lots of children of that of this new generation, they're generation three. So what happens is that they grow up in, you know, nice four or five bedroom houses. They don't with, know the struggle no, that parents and grandparents not. have no, to go through. Absolutely. Two bed two cars in the driveway, you know, um, two or three holidays a year, you know. They don't have to worry about putting bread or milk, you know, on the table. So it's very different. So, you know, sure, they have struggles and they have different mindsets and et cetera, et cetera. But that's generation three. Now, by default, there is this study. I can't remember when it was done, but there is this study to say the generation one is the poorest. Generation two will become the most successful and the wealthiest because they've seen it. Generation three, well, yeah, it will start declining because they, even though they understand, they, they, they value it, but they don't fully understand it because they never really went through it. And generation four, unfortunately, will blow it because they never really had. And even if you look at even simple things like, so my, you know, my, my, uh, I'm a Hindu, my native tongue is Gujarati. I speak it fluently. My brother speaks it fluently because growing up, my mum spoke it in the house and we spoke with my mum in Gujarati. My, both my daughters, they can understand a little bit because they speak to my mum, their gran in Gujarati. Yeah. They can't speak it. They can, they can maybe mumble a few words. They understand my elder one, you know, she can understand more than the younger one. But the chances are that their kids they won't even be able to read i mean it's an writing. effort like anything else it's an effort and you you probably would have to proactively take time in your daily lives on a weekly basis from very early age to to teach that to them i think it's a dilemma for for every parent if, especially if they're multinational yeah you know if you together speak four languages which ones do you pick do you just cram them all it's it's, it's a tough one because and i think look Sure, you can do that, but you also have to understand, actually, why am I doing this? Yeah, you know, exactly. Why, why am I teaching my kids this? Because when, when Sonny and I were young, we spoke Gujarati, but equally we spoke Gujarati to our aunts and our uncles and our grandparents and everyone there else. There was a purpose, there was a Absolutely. meaning and a reason. Here, I could teach my, my kids Gujarati, but they're going to speak to my mum and my wife's parents. They're not speaking to me, they're not speaking to my wife, they're not speaking to their uncles or aunts. So it's almost an opportunity English. cost. If you think about, should I teach them French or uh, should I teach them another language? Then of course, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And it's the same way in, in, in the generations, you know, as they go through certain things. And that drive is what, that, that lack of drive is probably what, what, what scares me the most. I think you're not the only one. But it's, 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 a, very, it's a very tough topic because we are in our own heads we have our own mindsets we've gone through our own struggles each generation before or after has completely different outlook completely different way of of moving thinking taking action different dreams different aspirations different fears also kind of systemic historic fears that mm -hmm. are induced by the well this generation it's probably media and insecurities and anxiety that they have you know in my parents and my grandparents it was the war mm -hmm. so the challenge is understanding what are they going through and whether story old age old question whether what we think is best for them is actually best for them yeah so absolutely. you might want to give them that fire but that might not be the most relevant thing that they need now in this yeah. age and going forward of course and we don't know what we don't yeah. know and and look you know i grew up with a brother so for me it's it was never as my daughter has turned 13 14 15 16 i'm realizing how young girls become young women 
and what goes through their minds and what they are thinking and how they are moving and 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 it's also very different to you know the previous generation right as you mentioned social media you know influences and you know how they are depicted and you know and everything that, that, that they go through i'm also seeing and understanding and learning myself because boys behave in a very very different way and we always have you know so no i get it completely We'll unpack this in the future. Yeah. You let me know if you get a solution there. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about the um, Asian Wealth magazine. So it is the UK's only luxury business uh, publication for Asian entrepreneurs, business leaders, and professionals. I was going to ask you what inspired you to create it. But now, given that you've told me a little bit about your early days, I understand that there's a natural pull towards the contrary of what you wanted to escape when you were young. So does that yes absolutely that was definitely one one of the pulls ultimately Dana what it was is that I've been in publishing for many many years and I, I started with an oil and gas magazine and then every every year at the start of every year I would subscribe to a whole load of magazines and I was as a business person I, was, I had a very keen interest in business and at the time 10 12 years ago I was always looking I was looking for something which really resonated with me you know, which was business, which was UK focused. Um, and I really struggled to find that, you know, um, everything that I was coming across, Forbes, Fortune, Inc, Entrepreneur, great titles, you know, but very American led. Mm -hmm. So they would, so there was always this transatlantic disconnect. So they would say, Dana ran her business like a quarterback on the field. So we get it, but we kind of don't get it. So the team and I, we said, well, look, you know, we're in publishing and if we can't find what we're looking for, then let's create our own. I didn't want to call it Asian Wealth. I wanted to call it Asian Entrepreneur, but the, the entrepreneur brand had applied for the rights in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. So to avoid any kind of uh, problems, we called it Asian Wealth. But the play on words, so wealth was always about wealth of knowledge, wealth of experience, mm. wealth of enterprise. You know, so that is really how it was born. So over the first 12, 24 months, we organically maneuvered ourselves into where we wanted to be positioned, which was then in the luxury premium bracket. Why that? Uh, because I think that's how organically it became. So we never, we didn't start off thinking that we, that's where we're going to be positioned. But because of our name, Asian Wealth, of course, people automatically, for some strange reason, don't <laughs> ask me why, right? But you know, people assume that the magazine for was for wealthy Asians, right? Um, go figure. So naturally, because and what ha what was happening at the same time, there was this very interesting move within the luxury. Um, industry which was luxury brands were trying something called exper experiential marketing so you had brands like Cartier um, who had their global campaigns what they were also doing is is trialing experiential experimental uh, uh, marketing which was tapping into certain groups whether it be Chinese market, the Jewish market, the Russian market, you know, the uh, the Indian market. These markets traditionally had big, big spending power. They would come in, they would buy, and they would buy big. So they were very active in trying, okay, well, how do we tap into this audience, this market, this community? So when it came to Asian wealth, we were the only ones positioned in that bracket, or we had positioned ourselves into that bracket because we were getting interest from these big luxury brands. They were the ones that paying us, they were the ones that advertising. So we maneuvered our position into that bracket, um, which then opened up the doors to work with lots of different luxury brands, which no other Asian-based publication or, or media platform had ever done before. So it was great for us, you know? But that's where, it, that's where it came from and that's where it stemmed from. And what were the biggest challenges in running the business throughout the years? Um, I think, you know, we we probably came in at the very last hour of when the media industry was starting to ch change, you know. Uh, we were... 2012 or 11, was it? Um, I think it was about 2012. 2012. 2012, so I think Instagram had been launched, but it was very young. You know, people were still advertising in print and it was lovely and, and it was glossy and, you know, the, the ink of the pages had a beautiful smell and and then... So I we can came smell in, the passion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and sp slowly, slowly over the years, and we're probably talking obviously like, you know, 10, 12 years ago. So as the years went on, digital became naturally a lot stronger. Um, and that's where actually we started to struggle. But in the in the first few years, you know, it was great. 
it was it, you know we had we had great fun doing it and we were when you say yeah. we is it you and your brother or so yeah i always say so so sunny and i yes but we had a small team as well mm -hmm. uh, we had a team as well so you know the our editor our head of digital etc cetera, etc cetera. so we had a great team putting everything together so the challenges yeah. you're describing were all due to the digitalization of the marketing and publishing space absolutely absolutely as i mean the, the challenges the challenges that we found number one was we were a very small fish in a very big pond so if you're you know in order for us to open the doors for let's say for argument's sake if we wanted to work with you know Audemars Piguet we we struggled we really struggled to go down the official route was maybe speaking to their agency which would then open the doors and then you know so many a times did we bypass the agency and we actually just went straight to the brands so many many companies many brands that we worked with Hublot, Porsche, uh, Rolls-Royce you know a lot of these brands that we worked with you know um, Etihad Airways you know a lot of these brands we bypassed their agencies because How? because essentially we had a good sales team and we knew what the answer was going to be you know we'd get blocked by these agencies constantly because we weren't big enough we didn't have a big enough we were never going to be the publication that had three four hundred thousand you know circulation you know at our height we had about 35 forty thousand circulation so approaching an agency and saying we have 35 forty thousand circulation we're targeted to British Asian you know um, audience the answer was not good enough, not big enough, not strong enough, you know. However, when we went directly to the brands, the marketing person, the marketing director, the head of brand, whatever it may, may be, when we spoke to them about it, very, very interested. And it's exactly what happened with Porsche. You know, Porsche was one of our... Because you're catering to their ideal customer. So absolutely. it makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Yeah. For the agencies, and I, and I, and I really, you know, I, we, we, you know, we really struggled with the agencies. So it became really annoying, you know, that they just, we just couldn't open the doors, you know. Um, so you realize that you can just make a shortcut that makes a lot absolutely. of sense. And sometimes we would leave the agencies embarrassed, you know, openly embarrassed, you know. Porsche, like I mentioned, you know, we spoke to their agency and they categorically said, your brand is not something that Porsche would be interested in. Then you, you came know? to them a week later and you're like, oh, Absolutely. I beg to differ. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, actually, it was my head of sales at the time. He had contacted the the brand manager for Porsche UK and his his reaction was, where have you guys been all my life? So the, the interesting thing was he sent an email to my head of sales, me, and copied in the agency guy who we had spoken to a few weeks prior, who had said, hey, you know, these guys would yeah. not be interested in you. That's how, you know, it, it was. But these are some of the challenges, obviously, that we faced. So what's happening with it now? Good question. So, so Asian Wealth is still around. Mm -hmm. um, we, pre-COVID, we really, really struggled because we had got to a stage where most of our advertisers were saying, we love working with you, we want to carry on, but we're putting a lot more time, money and effort into digital. So we, we dropped the print edition in 2018. We moved the uh, publication into digital. One of the biggest values for us was that we had this lovely pool of people that we had accumulated over the years. As clients or as guests or both, as... Mm -hmm. Both. So these were business people, professionals, business leaders, um, visionaries, creative people, high net worth, you know, just... People that you had interviewed that you had in any way, um, I'm thinking now in selling Coinvolta, <laughs> engaged in, in, the, in the magazine absolutely. in one way or another. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and it may not have just been people that we had interviewed. It could have just been people that had come into our world that we enjoyed their company and they added value to what we were doing so we we built up this wonderful pool of, of people um, and that was our biggest value so the brands like Audemars Piquet and Porsche and you know they wanted to engage with these people but it got harder and harder so in 2019 I said to Sunny I said we need to do something we need to pivot our business because I don't know what the media industry as a whole is going to look like in the next five years, mm. you know. So, how was that process of turning it digital? It was painstakingly hard because I, I you know, Dan, what does I, it take? 
in terms of just making yeah. everything digital. Yeah. We already had a digital footprint. We had already, you know, we were already on social media. We had an online presence. You know, we were already digital. So what was the hard part? The hard part was getting over the psychological part of it. So I come from a world where from traditional print, you know, as I mentioned, I love the smell of the ink on the pages. Okay. I love the touch and feel as do we as humans. You know, we are very we, we are those kind of creatures where we like something tangible. We like to touch and feel something that was now gone. So even though you could see still see pretty pictures online and, and on Instagram. Was it perhaps a feeling that is this even real if it's not there physically? Um, I guess so. And I guess you know, probably one of the. The challenging parts for me, Dana, was I'm a very creative person and I was using the photo shoots that we did in the magazine as part of my crea creative outlets. So now these things were all changing. These things were taken away. You know, sure, we could do still do the shoots and and have them online, but it's a very different feeling than seeing your, your images in print or online. Very, very different. So we got to that point and we said okay we need to decide what we're going to do and the talk of a club had been on the cards for a while so in 2020 we launched founders club i see how that's a perfect transition mm. so tell me more about founders club so founders club we launched in 2020 in the midst of um, uh, a lockdown. And it actually happened because... So wait, let me get this straight. <laughs> Members Club, Networking Club, launched during the midst of COVID. <laughs> mm. Tell me more. So I, no, I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you how it actually came about. So every, at the start of we, the family and I, we find ourselves in the Maldives. I represent a resort in the Maldives. So every start of the year, um, we, we are there. While we were in the Maldives in January, Sunny and I spent a day, you know, just on the back of an envelope, writing down, right, if we're going to do this club, what does this club look like? Who would join? Why would someone pick our club over somebody else's club? And so just a little side note. So essentially, you were at that at that moment where you realized that the biggest value add of Asian wealth is actually that community. Correct. And on top of that, you were missing some sort of creative action and engagement and outlet and so with that you kind of paired them together and created what made Asian wealth the best anyway so the community yeah the creative part the creative part I'm still searching for um you know I'm still making that my cup own, is never filled that cup is never ever filled I'm still making my own inroads and filling um uh, the, my creative cup but what it came down to, we looked at our audience and we said, this is our people. This is our, you know, our audience. How do we bring value to those people? One of the things that we've done very, very well with Asian Wealth was we had great events. We had great parties. People knew that we knew how to throw a party, right? We had the best parties. But there was always something more where we felt, actually, you know, it's great to have an event, chink a few glasses, you know, listen to some great music and connect with some great people, but then what? So it came down to, again, value. I had been a member of a whole bunch of clubs over the years. Sunny had been a member of clubs. And we always felt there was always something missing. It's like you could go to a restaurant and you could sit there and you could say, that's good, but it, it could be great. That meal is good, but it could be great. That service it, is good, but it could be great. So for us, it was like, okay, well, there's something missing what here. What was that? You know, it was, I was a member of a club where they had about six, 700 members, but I never knew who those six, 700 members were. The only time I would get to meet them is if I walked into a room full of 100 people and you'd see the name tag, you know, and so you're, you're in that room for two hours, you know, you're not going to meet 100 people. So it was either that. So for me, it was one of the, just one of the things was, okay, well, we need to be transparent. If you are joining our club, you have to be able to connect with every single person in that club. You have to be able to see who they are at the touch of a button. So now in our, you can see every single member who's, who's part of the club, what industry they sit in and a short bio on them as well. And you can reach out to those people. Nice. So for us, it was actually, that's what I want to do, you know? I didn't enjoy walking into the room of 100 people. So actually, how do we build relationships in a room of 20 people or 25 people? You know, that's where you build. So these kind of things where we walked into knowing that this is where the value is. And it equally has to just be, you know, what is value? So we, we were asking all these kind of very deep questions, you know, in January while sitting 
in this resort. And then we, we flew back in Feb. And as we were flying back, the news broke of this virus, COVID-19. Not knowing, obviously... What would it entail? Yeah, absolutely. Only until we got back and then obviously the world pretty much came to an end. But in a way, that was a blessing, Dana, because it gave Sunny and I a great time to really put our head down and really look into this club and say, right, okay, well, let's look into the dynamics of this. Why would someone join this club? You know, what's in it for them? You know, we've talked so much about value. What is that value? What is, you know, what separates us from anybody else out there? And in the summer of 2020 is when we officially opened the doors and we mm. launched. So how do you curate your members and ensure that sense of community? We looked at us. We looked at us and we said, our members have to be people like us, you know, where, you know, we are, and even to this date now, where we're coming up to 300 members in the club, it's very simple. You know, we have, you have to be a, the prerequisite, you have to be a founder or a co-founder or an affiliate founder. So you've taken over a family business or uh, purchased a, a franchise or something like, along those lines. We generally pick founders who are at least a couple of years into their business because they are now in that kind of serious growth stage. They have to have a growth mindset. That's hugely important. They have to be wanting and willing to grow. Because from what we've spoken about before, you mentioned that it's not only the community, the connection, the events. It's also the facilitating of their entrepreneurial journey that you yes. provide in this Founders yeah, Club. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, you know, it's great for us to say... Our job in the club, Dana, is is to go beyond, say, networking. or Because when we ask someone, why do you want to join the club? The answer that we always get is, I want to connect with like-minded people. I want to interact with like-minded people. But it's only when we peel back that layer to understand why. What does that mean? You know, why do you want to connect with people? Why do you, you want to connect with like-minded people? Is it because you want to find your next customer? Is it because you want to, you're feeling lonely in your business? Support. Yeah. Is it because you are trying to raise investment in your business? Is it, so it's only once we ask that question, do we start really getting real answers? Yes. Um, and that's where the value is. It's, it's, it's beyond. And now we've got, now we're two and a half years into the, into the club. We're now getting into very, very kind of deeper psychological um, value adds for our members, which is personal growth, mental growth. It is very much kind of... So is it coaching and mentoring and workshops? Absolutely. And mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, and it, it, sometimes it's not just that. Last year, we hosted eight of our members um, who went up to Scotland to do a whiskey tasting. And it was only for 36 hours. A great experience for 36 hours. Half of those members had never been to Scotland. and And part of it was because... You know, it was always on their list, but the same the time. Yeah. So, you know, it's just like, you know, there's a lot of places that have been on our list for a long, long time. Unless it's put in front of us, unless it's put with the right people. And those eight people have now become like great friends with each other. They will do things outside of the club. Once every couple of months, they'll get together and, you know, they'll they'll go for nights out and whatnot, you know. And and that's okay for us. That's that's one of the things that I love that the club has created and been able to facilitate because for those people, it's it's that fulfillment that they've now created this group. And they're being fulfilled and they're, be, they're growing together, you know. So for, for us, that's kind of the deeper parts of, of the club. Hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking about all the members clubs that are, you know, famously here in central London. You have mm. your Annabelle's, 5H, you know, Home House, etc. Uh, and even Soho House. And they're almost completely different category of of members clubs yeah because th there is just a venue and you do that you go there you enjoy your time you have a great meal you go there with your friends but it's very rarely there's an occasion where you actually meet the other members yeah and you know over time i know they've tried to improve it better and so as actually has you know they have these dashboards and you know these member mixers which is really nice but however it's it's very different when the whole kind of membership and the networking club is actually built around connecting people yeah. on a on a deeper level so i think there's yeah there's definitely market for that and 
Yeah, uh, you know, it, it's um, and look, when we opened our doors initially, Danny, you know, there was there was many other questions, you know, very similar questions. Are you a physical club? Um, are, do you plan to be a physical club? You know, and besides being kind of listed at the top of you know members club uh, or membership club, you know, we're very different propositions. You know, of course, you know those as you as you mentioned are, are physical places, physical buildings. For us, if you are going to spend a couple of thousand pounds and become a member of of Founders Club, you are walking into and you know that you're walking into something different. You may join, you know, any of Annabelle's Arts or, you know, any of the other clubs like that because you may just want a place to go and and be. Yeah. You know, you're joining a club like Founders because you want to evolve. You know, that's essentially what it is. You want to grow. Now, whether what that And grow together. Yeah, absolutely. You know, what that growth looks like is very different member to member, but you want to, you know, you want to build that ecosystem. You want to be part of a unit, essentially. You know? Because it gets so, so lonely. It does, yeah. I don't care who you are, what you do, it can be a lonely road. I work with my brother. My brother and I are immensely close, but sometimes, naturally, you know, I, I still feel lonely. And I know he feels lonely. Imagine the solopreneurs. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have one of our members, a really, really lovely guy, and he was saying, I feel really, really lonely in my business because when I, I, I go to the pub with my friends and when I talk about increasing my business from a £10 million business to a £30 million business, they don't get it. They don't understand what I'm saying, you know, because they are in banking and they're in, um, you know, health and fitness and they're in this and they're in that, you know, but they can't understand. So, you know, my aggressive growth mentality to say, okay, I want to grow my business from here to here. So I have to sit there quietly. So it is a lonely road. Yeah. It can be a lonely road. So, so important to have that support system community where you can share and people that can just share their own knowledge and support you. Of course. With that understanding. Because of course, it's it's nice to have, some people don't have supportive friends and family. So it's nice yes. to have supportive friends and family, but it's also nice to have somebody that actually understands where you're coming from. Yeah, Absolutely. So if I asked you mm -hmm. three big lessons you've picked up over the years for yourself that you treasure dearly, what would they be? So my first big lesson that I've learned is to remember you don't know what's happening in somebody else's world. I used to be a person who was very much, this is what I think and this is what I do and this is, who I am and I'm saying this to you and if you are not saying or behaving in a certain way then I'm thinking what's wrong with you you know but I've realized that everyone has their own journey everyone has their own story and you never know what is happening in somebody else's world somebody else's life you know somebody else's day you don't know what's happening in somebody else's day right so to be a lot more mindful to be you know completely mindful the other thing i've learned is we are all human and i say that in a way because i've had the pleasure and privilege of sitting with people who are immensely successful who own cornerstones to countries only to realize that they're still human we, there is they have this, the same problems they have the same problem maybe at different levels but they still have the, they still have the same problems right um i still find it very fascinating because generally as humans we'll look at people who are uber successful and we we will treat them as demigods as we'll treat them like they're not human like you know you know and it's okay to be in awe of someone it's okay to be inspired by someone but it's very important to understand we're all human you know we all face insecurities we all doesn't matter who you are i've got friends whose wealth runs into hundreds of millions and they still have insecurities. Of course. You know, we're all human. It's right? like supermodels not feeling beautiful. Yeah, like absolutely. We, we all go through the same struggles. And this is a very good point. I, I speak about this often, which is not putting people on a pedestal. Yeah. I've certainly done that. And it's hard. In some certain situations, it's hard not to do that. Mm. But it's, as you say, it's very important to always keep in mind that fundamentally, we have so much more in common mm. than we don't. Yeah. So there's no reason to put somebody on a pedestal to the point where, as you say, they seem like demigods or yeah. they're, in the end of the yeah. day, they still go to bed, they still sleep, 
You wake Ab- up. Absolutely. Like if us. if anything, you know, generally the more successful they become, and I, I'm talking financially, the more. Hi there. I hope you're enjoying this episode. You can listen to the full audio version for free on your favorite podcast app. And if you are enjoying this video version, I invite you to join my exclusive Patreon community to support the making of the show and to unlock a ton of exclusive content, such as the full video episodes, bloopers, some controversial topics, and more personal questions from the guests, and much more. Link is in the description below.